Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I think we all love our Christmas stories. All the different ways of hearing it, from the music to different books and scripture itself. I know that I do, and I love any chance to hear the story of Christmas. It's one of my favorite times of the year. I love John 1, as you all know, if you were here for Christmas Eve services, because I consider it the real Christmas story. And it starts out in the beginning. It tells us how in the beginning that we are finally coming in with God and all the things God made. And it tells of how Jesus has been there from the beginning of time. I love the story of the birth of Jesus because there's so much anticipation going on. And the twists and turns of the story, think about it for a moment, of Mary finding out that she's pregnant and knowing a society she's going to have to face. But an angel of the Lord comes to her and gives her peace. Imagine Joseph going, well, what am I going to do with this? And you wonder what he is going to do. Is he going to leave her? Is he going to have her stoned? But then the angel of the Lord comes and gives him peace. And then once you think everything looks like it's going to be good, they have to take this 10-day journey to Bethlehem on this rocky terrain, which is no fun at all, especially when you're just about to have a child at any minute. And then they get to is our to Bethlehem. And you're finally, they're finally there from the journey to be told, there's no room for you. Keep going. But yet, in all the confusion, the fear, the twist and the turns, God in the flesh came to live among us. I know we love the story, I know I do, of the shepherds in the field. For they were out there tending their flock when suddenly the angel of the Lord comes to them and gives them the glad news, telling them about the birth of Christ, inviting them in to the story in which they don't they go with haste and they go and they are the first to witness God in the flesh among us. And not only are they witnesses, they don't keep it to themselves. If you remember, they go and they proclaim. And today is the epiphany. And it is now time that our journey continues. As we walk away from Christmas, we still yet get another of one of my favorite stories. The story of the Magi, also known as the Wise Men. I know we can tell about 20 jokes right there, but let's not. <laughs> this story is about the world being invited to be a witness to the Incarnation. To be part of the incarnation. It is about seeking. It's about finding. It's about giving. It's about witnessing. It's also about sharing. It's about a God who loves us so much that He came into the world to save the world from sin and quite frankly to save us from ourselves. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn it, but Jesus came into the world to save it. Thanks be to God. I love to tell this story each and every year at Epiphany. I love to tell the Epiphany story again and again. Why? Because it really is part of our story. I know I say that several times in the year, and it's almost hard for us to comprehend how can we be part of a story that was written so long ago. But it is your story. It is about you because the story we have been brought into is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, making us children of God. And it's God's story. And we are His children. So it's your story, too. Are you ready for the story, kids? <laughs> you want to hear it? Let's hear it again. The story is about the traveling wise men. We actually know very little about these visitors, but the Bible tells us that they came from the east to Jerusalem. Popular myth uh, calls them astrologers, and that may be a possibility. 
and it is generally accepted that the Magi were a priestly class from Persia, once a mighty country where modern day Iran and Iraq are now located. Eventually, in the second century of church history, they go from Magi, they get promoted, and become kings. It was a church father named Tertullian who suggested that these men were kings because the Old Testament readings, the ones that you heard today, predicted that kings would come and worship the Christ. Tertullian also concluded that there were three kings because based on the number of gifts mentioned, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. As the story goes, the wise men traveled towards the star on a trip that would have taken several, several months. Some astro astronomers today uh, believe that what the wise men may have actually seen were not the stars or a star, but actually planets. Remember, at this time, they don't understand planets like we did today, but they see brighter and brighter stars. What they think, uh, uh, astrologers today think, um, astronomers think today, is that in that particular time period, give about a year or so um, of the time, the actual location of time, that what had happened was there was a huge event in the sky. It was Saturn and Jupiter that had actually come together, making, they said, would have been a spectacular show in the air, showing a huge, looking at that time, star. What's actually quite cool about it, I think, but I'm kind of a nerd, so I, is that Saturn at the time, that particular star, was represented for kings. And Jupiter was the star that represented Israel. Imagine both of them coming together, and you can see the message, King Israel. So as the story continues, the wise men get to the area around Bethlehem. So they naturally seek where a newborn king would live. Obviously it would be the residence of the current king of the Jews, Herod. Herod's fort and palace, Herodom, is on a high mountaintop. And it's a mountain, and down below in the valley is a town of Bethlehem. So if you can almost picture it, this valley below is Bethlehem, which you go up on this mountain, it's been cut off on top, and that's Herodom. That's the palace of Herod. And it's about three miles away from Bethlehem. So naturally, they would go there, right? And when they get there, they announce to the palace that they are here to see the newborn king of the Jews. Imagine their faces. What? Well, it says the Bible, the scriptures say that Herod became fearful and that all Jerusalem feared with him for very good reason. If you know anything about Herod, he's a psycho and a genius, you would understand why. He was nobody to play with. You did not want someone like Herod to be fearful because fear leads to self-centeredness. Fear can cause a lack of good judgment. Fear can cause us to be blind to the whole and big picture. Fear can cause us to act out in really negative ways. So when the Magi came to Herod, searching for the newborn king, he was quick to play along. But do not think for a moment that Herod wasn't fearful. Very fearful. He was fearful quite a few times in his life. Matter of fact, he killed a few of his children and family members because there were just rumors that they wanted to be king. That's the kind of person we're talking about. He calls together his scholars, his own scholars and scribes, and he goes and asks them more about the Messiah. When is the Messiah supposed to come? Where is the Messiah to be born? And they tell him, in a town called Bethlehem, in other words, right down the mountain. After talking to his own scholars and scribes, Herod goes back and it says in secret, he calls the Magi together to find out the exact time the star had appeared. It obviously been several months or so, and that's what they tell him. After they tell him the time and how it appeared and what they did to prepare, 
Herod sends the wise men out back down to Bethlehem and told them to go and search for the child. Go diggingly and look for him. And then, when you do, come back. Report to me so that I may go and worship him. The wise men continue on their journey back over to Bethlehem, again, just three miles away. Scripture tells us that it says that they followed the star until it stops over where Jesus is, was found. And there they find Jesus in a house with Mary and Joseph. And they pay him homage. They present him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The first gift was gold. And gold signifies a gift that you would give to kings, giving Jesus a kingly status. The second gift was frankincense. Frankincense was uh, an ingredient used by the priests in the temple worship to blend in with the smell of the sacrifices. Probably a good idea. But it also gives Jesus a priestly role. What is the third gift? Myrrh. Myrrh in Jesus' time was used by very wealthy people, and myrrh was used to embalm their dead. All three presents at the time, by the way, were of equal value because it was extremely hard to get. But I've often wondered, and I hope you will think about this too, I have often wondered, how did they know? How did the Magi know what to bring? Were they told ahead of time by the same angel of the Lord of exactly who Jesus is? How did they know he was king? I think it's quite interesting. How did they know that Jesus was born to die for the sins of the world? Something to think about. After they presented their gifts to Jesus, it is later, I guess, that night that after a dream, the wise men were told not to return back to Herod, but to go home back to their country on another path. And so they do. When word finally gets to Herod that they have left and they're gone, he is outraged. He feels betrayed. So he orders the killing of all male children two years and younger in the land. But thankfully, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph flee to each of his refugees until Herod dies. Herod, who, think about it, had all the scholarly texts at his hands, had all the information that prophets have written. He had the scholars and the scribes right there at his beck and call, telling him all about the Messiah, allows fear to rule him. He allows fear to rule him and preventing him from seeing God in the flesh. The fear that ruled over him prevented Herod from seeing Christ himself. He could have gone and seen uh, it. It prevented him from finding the Christ. It prevented him from giving his gifts to Jesus. And it prevents him from worshiping the Messiah, the, the Savior of the world. Think about that. Fear stopped him from all of this. What a unique opportunity. I always found it sad. So what about us? Are we like Herod and allow fear of this world to rule over us and therefore miss the different opportunities that Christ has for us or seeing Christ himself in our life? Or are we like the wise men, despite the fear, despite the distance, despite the obstacles, we seek, we find, we give, and we witness? I think the truth is, we've probably played a little of both. A little Herod and a little of the wise men. Because quite frankly, in this world, it's easy to do. You see, today we live, and this has always been this way, but today we live in what I call a culture of fear. It's all around us. Think about it. I did a class about this, if you remember last year, about how fear plays a huge role, by the way, on purpose, to, uh, for us to respond in different ways. We see fear in the news media, always feeding us fear. Why? 
So you'll watch over and over and over. So I'm going to feed you uh, fear. We even see fear then come into the advertisements so that I can sell you something. Don't think I'm getting here. Fear sells. And therefore, we feed fear to each other all the time. We see fear on the internet with stories that may or may not be true. It doesn't matter anymore. Instead, it's the fear that we want to sell, not the truth. Fear can even be in politics today. I don't know about you, where I used to be excited about reading about politics. I get scared sometimes to see what's going on. All of these things, all of these, the news advertisement, all of this, all these things have brought fear into our homes, our hearts, and even in our lives. And for that, we need to be careful not to allow this fear to become our ruler. That's what we need to prevent. In fear, Herod, instead of seeking Christ, hunkered down unto himself. He allowed fear to not see the big picture of what's really going on and that he even heard about. He allowed fear to not even allow him to seek the Christ because he was scared of what he may find. If he's the newborn king, who am I? He allowed fear to make him lash out in a horrible, horrible way. And he always allowed fear to make him isolated by himself. But in that culture of fear, that surrounded Jerusalem that night, because the scriptures say that all of Jerusalem is in fear, because what is he going to do now? In all of that fear, the wise men did not get caught up in the culture of fear that night. And you can imagine, they probably heard about it on their way to Bethlehem. But instead, they continued on their journey. They seek the Christ, they found the Christ, and they gave to the Christ because they believed that Jesus was the newborn king of the Jews. They believed, and so should we. Believing in Jesus, I don't think, is necessarily hard. We may not always understand everything. Quite frankly, none of us uh, understand the mind of God. But I think we all believe it's why you're here this morning. However, Faith can be a challenge when fear creeps into, into our lives. But when it does, we do have a choice. Do we seek ourselves or do we seek Christ? In other words, do we live in fear as Herod or do we live in faith as the wise men? Well, here is the good news. And there's always good news in Jesus Christ. Jesus is much more powerful than fear. I'm going to repeat that because I want you to remember it. Jesus is much more powerful than fear. He just, we just need to believe it. And no matter how bad it seems, and there are times it does seem bad, no matter how the fear is strong, no matter if it feels like the world is changing, because guess what? It is. It always has been changing. One thing has always held true. Jesus is still the king. Jesus is still the king. Jesus is the king of the universe. Jesus is the king of us. Jesus has always been the king. It tells us in John 1, in the beginning. Jesus is the uh, king here in the present time. And Revelation tells us Jesus will be the king of the future. So why fear? We just have to have the faith and real trust that Jesus is the true king of the world, no matter how the world changes. When we walk away from the fear of the world and instead journey towards the peace of Christ, it is then that we can truly be a witness and live into the incarnation. Again, it is about seeking Christ every day in your life. It is about finding Christ in your life. It's about giving to Christ in your life. It's about witnessing Christ in your life. And it's about sharing Christ with others. When we do this, this is when we can share our gifts with Christ as He shares His love with us.
with us. You can try to rule on your own, or you can allow Christ to be the ruler he came to be. Like the wise men, let us really, really choose wisely. And in this year to come, let us remember who really is our king. And we're going to be okay if we love each other and find and see the peace of God. Amen.